It's my privilege to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Danielle Allen. Um, Danielle Allen is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University and Director of Harvard's Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics. She's a political theorist who has published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought. Widely known for her work on justice and citizenship in both ancient Athens and modern America. Allen is the author of The World of Prometheus, The Politics of Punishing and Democratic Athens, Talking to Strangers, Anxieties of Citizenship, and Brown and versus the Board of Education, Why Plato Wrote, Our Declaration, A Reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, Education and Equality, and Cuz, The Life of Michael A. And, and I would uh, implore anybody who hasn't read Cuz, in, in addition to all of her works, to really um, read that book. That book has really um, taken its place alongside of, uh, in my mind, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow as an indispensable um, uh, literary work on uh, the system of mass <laughs> incarceration. She is the co-editor of the award-winning Education, Justice, and Democracy, and from Voice to Influence, Understanding Citizenship in the Digital Age. She is chair of the Mellon Foundation, past chair, Mellon Foundation Board, past chair of the Pulitzer Prize Board, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Allen is also the principal investigator for the Democratic Knowledge Project, a distributed research and action lab at Harvard University. The Democratic Knowledge Project seeks to identify, strengthen, and disseminate the bodies of knowledge, skills, and capacities that democratic citizens need in order to succeed at operating their democracy. The lab currently has three projects underway, the Declaration Resources Project, the Humanities and Liberal Arts Assessment Project, and the Youth and Participatory Politics Action and Reflection Frame. And I'll say before um, uh, just giving it over to Professor Allen is that I think she's uh, really one of the most important um, scholars, not just at Harvard University, but that we have in the country just because of the way in which she's talking about issues of race, democracy, and citizenship um, in deep and profound ways, not just in comparative ways, but um, on a day like this where we're celebrating the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, one of King's greatest legacies is this idea of interrogating radical citizenship. And the black freedom struggle and social justice movements have always been deeply connected with small d democracy. And so her work is so important and instructive in terms of illuminating what we mean by that, researching what we mean by that, but also connecting it to how we live as actual citizens in this democratic experiment. Without further ado, Professor mm -hmm. Danielle Allen. Thank you, Camille. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I think I decided yesterday that this is the hardest assignment I have ever had. So I was going to start by saying thank you to Professor Gates, but I'm not sure I can say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it is such a privilege and honor and pleasure to be with Professor Gates, Brother West, my long old teacher and dear friend, Professor Wilson, whom I've admired for so long, my beautiful, incredible colleagues, Tommy Shelby, Brandon Terry, and everybody else who's here, people I've been in conversation with for such a long time. The title of my remarks today uh, is Courage, which was mainly because I needed to make sure I was going to get here today. <laughs> but uh, it does pertain to what we've been talking about all day. I had some slides cycling through for those of you who are here early. I'll just go ahead and show you uh, what they are real fast without much comments. They're all things you know about. But just this is, a, uh, this is a way of taking a picture of our world, a photograph of our world. All right, so that red arrow is the point where income inequality starts rising. All right, so they're, they're, they go together, the double helix, these things. <coughs> Can't really see that in detail, but those are drug arrests by race, black, white, same date starting point. And you, some of you may have seen that New York Times data display, 1.5 million missing black men. Yeah. 
So Dr. King spoke in churches. He started with text. He always had a text. All right, my text today is. So my text today is a little bit from a testament of hope. Why is the issue of equality still so far from solution in America? A nation that professes itself to be democratic, inventive, hospitable to new ideas, rich, productive, and awesomely powerful. The problem is so tenacious because despite its virtues and attributes, America is deeply racist and its democracy is flawed, both economically and socially. Mm. It's a posthumous essays. It's one of the last things he wrote. So it's, you know, those in that category of among the last words. And also from 1968, offered an answer to that question. And it's not the answer that you'll expect. It's not the answer that goes straight to the policy question. It goes to the kind of places that Brother West was just talking about. Mm -hmm. Through our scientific and technological genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make it a brotherhood. Mm. Question and answer. So that's what I, those are my texts, that question, that answer. Why is issue of equality still so far from solution? because we haven't acquired a commitment, an ethical commitment to make the world a brotherhood. What does that mean? King had lots of big policy arguments. We heard about basic minimum income, social democrat. I think that's the right account of what he was. But he also made the case that every single institution and organization in America had to reconfigure itself, <laughs> had to reorganize itself around an ethical commitment to brotherhood. You could also call it a principle of non-domination. People have talked about this idea for a long time. There are lots of other ways of describing it. There's Lincoln. Mm -hmm. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. All right, and that's a deep notion about equality, that you can overturn oppression and domination without yourself acquiring it in the process because you can begin to share power, participate in power, but use it in an egalitarian way mm -hmm. on the basis of egalitarian habits, mm -hmm. habits not tainted by domination. Or Ralph Ellison, what we're looking for is a winner take nothing democracy. All right, and these are all ways of further elaborating the principle of nonviolence. So I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Because that's, you have to think about that. What would it mean to actually reorganize a whole fabric of institutions throughout civil so society around the principle of power sharing and an ethical commitment to nonviolence in that power sharing? Right, what would it mean for this university, even, to think about that? You could change all the organizations, and you do change the world because you put decision-making in the hands of people who will wield power differently. That's the core idea. And so if you want to solve the problem of equality, you have to solve the problem of power sharing, and not just the problem of power sharing, the question of how people wield power. Mm. And that's where somebody else said today, I don't remember, it may have been you, and I apologize if I've <laughs> forgotten who it was, that the principle of nonviolence isn't a principle of weakness. It's, you said it was yeah. coercive. Yeah. I would say something slightly different. I wouldn't say coercive, but I was, it is power. Yeah. Yeah. It is power. It's a way of wielding power without dominating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's the world that we're trying to build when we pursue equality, but it requires that ethical commitment to make it a brotherhood through that way of thinking about power. Now, what does that actually mean? I want to tell a little small story. Margaret Weir earlier today expressed a concern that in our current efforts to pursue equality, a lot of us are engaged in things that feel small. Mm -hmm. Whereas you read King's work, you go back to his work, and the canvas he painted on was so big. Mm -hmm. And there seems like such a gap between that small and the big. Mm. I want to make a bit of a case for the small, actually, configured in ways that build out a life of commitment. So the small story is this one. So I've spent the last almost two years working in this university on something called the Task Force for Inclusion and Belonging. And when President Faust first invited me to work on this, we had a conversation and they said, well, Ah, it's inclusion and belonging thing. In all honesty, I think the concept that matters is non-domination. 
can we have a task force on non-domination? And she's like, eh, Danielle, I don't know about that. <laughs> Not sure how we'll be able to sell that to the faculty. Inclusion and belonging. I said, all right, okay. I'll do inclusion and belonging. That's, that's cool. Anyway, we worked hard all the way through. And there came a certain point in the fall where, in all honesty, I was pretty tired of it. Pretty tired of it, pretty frustrated. And as I was feeling tired or frustrated, I was also going through all the data of university, sort of data, for example, Kennedy School, we'll talk about that in a minute, student admissions, African-American student population in Kennedy School has gone down in the last decade from 9% in 2005 to 4% in 2015 mm -hmm. during the period of Barack Obama's presidency. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, I was you know, going through data like this and so forth, but as I was going through this data, I also noticed bright spots, the medical school. Medical school was doing amazing things, actually, to change the way in which students were experiencing that campus. And I knew that Joan Reed had been doing this work. I knew she'd been steadily for decades doing this work, but I hadn't really seen it until I saw it in all the data. So I called Joan. I was like, Joan, how have you been doing this for so long? How have you kept at it? And she said, it's the civil rights movement, Danielle. Mm. It never ended. It's still here, mm -hmm. and this is where it's happening. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. Joan, I hear you, and I understand the responsibility of that. So the point of that small story is you might think that working on something like inclusion and belonging in one of the uh, most elite, cushiest, feather-bedded places in the world mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't really count as participating in the civil rights movement. You might say, mm -hmm. invoking King, that that looks kind of like an example of falling into the bad habit of the drum major instinct. You know, fiddling at the margins, just in his words, he described the drum major instinct as a sort of a, a basic desire for recognition, for importance, for a, attention, a desire to be first. Mm -hmm. The negative version of that view is the sort of thing my colleague Harvey Mansfield said to the Boston Globe about the task force work. Danielle, like Du Bois, should just be happy to be at Harvard. Mm. I am happy to be at Harvard, mm. but that's not enough. I'm happy to be at Harvard, but I expect to make this place a better place. And not for myself, mm -hmm. not because of a drum major instinct. Mm -hmm. And that's what Joan was making the point about. What we are building here together is, look around us, halls of power. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was working outside the halls of power. So to some extent, part of our job is to figure out how to take his legacy and understand it, including the principle of nonviolence, inside the halls of power. Mm. And it matters, and again, it's not just about the small numbers, the, say, two African-American women who are in the Masters of Public Policy program in the Kennedy School right now. It matters for them, and I've been alone a lot in a lot of different kind of contexts in that regard, and it does take courage to stay in those spaces over and over and over again. So it's not just for those small numbers, because, if I have my slides back again, oops. Thanks. Oops. Well, you know what I'm going to say. The halls of power are connected to the guns in the prison watchtowers. Mm. So it's never just about us here in places like Harvard. That is, if we think about what we're doing here in the right kinds of ways, in the spirit of a committed life. And this is where Brother West gave my remarks just a little bit before. In his words, he put it, it's a question of whether or not as you become a professional, you stay a warrior. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a professional, you become a conformer. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard thing because the world that we live in now, there's no question but that it has generated all kinds of professional opportunity for African Americans. And I stand here as the result of the hard work of the 1960s and the 1970s, and we all do. And at the same time that we've benefited and been able to take advantage of increases of opportunities, we've been participating in this world that's been pulling apart. Mm -hmm. So some of us have gotten to ride the elevator, yeah. and a lot of, uh, most of us have fallen, and I don't know what you wanna call it, this is where I need you. 
What's the opposite of elevator? The depressorator? I don't know. I need, I need the opposite of elevator, right? The way our economy has pulled apart. The descender, the falling, the experience of falling, exactly. And so then it's the hard question of how do you put together the opportunity in a context like this with the basic problem of the inequality that plagues our world? A problem that is indeed one which involves an intersection of race and class. Again, double helix. People forget that segregation, et cetera, were economic structures, property structures. So while it's true, I think it may have been you again who said, or maybe I've lost track now, but it's such a rich conversation, that, no, it was actually you who said, early in the 20th century, it wouldn't have made any sense to tell African Americans that their fight was a class struggle, because white supremacy dominated so completely. But it is nonetheless the case, despite the truth of that, also the case that all those structures of white supremacy were economic structures, always. And consequently, you cannot actually address or understand them, I think, unless you're always thinking about economic questions and the political questions together. And so in that regard, the questions that we face now are one where there's a double helix of race and class, and which ought best to be addressed by tackling them through policy and political approaches that unite the issues of race and class. But still, I want to say a little bit more about what it means to connect the world that we live in here at Harvard to these broader issues of equality. So let me just go back again to the specific situation here in the Kennedy School. So I gave you the figures around African American enrollment, the public policy master's program. 9% of were African Americans in 2005 decade later, 4%. Hispanics, 12% in 2005. A decade later, 7%. Asian Americans, 10% in 2005. 7% in 2015. A part of this story is about internationalization. Mm -hmm. The international population of the Kennedy School has grown dramatically, and that's important. And this is also a part of the question of how we pursue a neighborhood, a world that's a neighborhood, also has an ethical commitment to brotherhood in it. But I don't think the Kennedy School has found the right balance yet in thinking about the relationship between equality and the pursuit of egalitarian training and policy in the domestic space and in the global space. So I think we have work to do right here in a sort of put your bucket down where you are kind of spirit. Mm. But know as you do that it's committed to, connected to a much bigger picture. And to keep that connection alive, to always be pushing it forward, does require, I think, what King called sometimes a dangerous unselfishness, mm -hmm. a willingness to think about how to combine being a professional with being a warrior, being an advocate, speaking up, not taking the easy path. And again, that sounds like a small story, back to Margaret's point, but I think if you focus on that ethical commitment, it becomes a much bigger story. So I want to just give two examples of people that I take to be really critical civil rights heroes whose work at some point in their lives may not have seemed so significant from the point of view of policy activism. I'll say their names and you'll immediately resonate with the conviction that they are heroes. Brian Stevenson yeah. and Lonnie Bunch. Oh, yeah. But what have they done exactly? Because what they've done is something different. All right, so Brian working hard in Montgomery on death penalty cases, expanding his practice beyond death penalty exoneration to all other kinds of cases reflecting injustice in the criminal justice system, juvenile justice, for example, and so forth. And as he's going into court over and over again, what does he discover? He discovers that he can't move judges, he can't move juries, because they don't know history, because they depend on myths, myths of a South that tells its history entirely in terms of the glories of the Confederacy, the freedom that the South used to have, should preserve, and has mythological stories of the reasons African Americans are in desperate situations. And against the backdrop of that bad history, produce one after another unjust court decision. And so what does Brian do? Brian decides, as you all probably now know, to build a memorial to lynching in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. 
And when he starts, Montgomery doesn't have any memorials, despite even the fact of Dr. King's presence in the city, to enslaved people. Lots of memorials to the Confederacy, no memorials to enslaved mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. He buys land secretly, mm -hmm. doesn't tell anybody what it's for, says it's just for a history project, right? History of the South project. <laughs> Gets the, all the permits, et cetera, with this broad label on it. Builds a beautiful design and it's opening in April. 3,000 stone yeah. pillars, one name on each yeah. for the lynching victims who've been recorded around the South. Yeah a pair of these pillars so that for each victim, the charge will be to the county where the lynching was committed, that it repatriate the stone and place a monument in that county. So that the whole structure of the South should have monuments to anchor a full accounting of American history. Mm -hmm. Now, in other words, it started off as a scholarly project. It's a history project. Brian was gonna step out of being a lawyer, be a historian for a little minute. But th what he was doing in that was establishing a foundation for the creation of the ethical commitment to brotherhood that is necessary to build an egalitarian society. Mm. That is, it's not just about policy, it's also about the intellectual paradigms. The clarifying work that Professor Shelby and Terry did today as they went through Martin Luther King's political thought we can't actually support the big scale policy changes that would be necessary to tackle inequality without building the underlying intellectual framework. Mm -hmm. the same with Lonnie Bunch, the beautiful museum in Washington, D.C. Mm. That took him how long? You probably know, 20 years at least. 20 years mm. that took him. And when he was talking about it in Chicago, people thought he was crazy. <laughs> thought he was crazy. But he kept doing it. And it's exactly the kind of thing nobody would credit in some sense as activism in the first case. But look at all those people who have been passing through the museum of all kinds. And to make American history one that everybody knows, not the kind of experience where I know the story of slavery and I know the story of Jim Crow and I know the story of lynching and I know the story of segregation because it's all in my family. It gets passed down from generation to generation. But every new generation of white students I encounter, I gotta teach the history to them. Mm -hmm. They don't have it, generation after generation, despite the incredible work of scholars. We shouldn't have to keep doing that work. There should be a shared national understanding. Yeah. And that's what Lonnie has built for us finally, the possibility of that. And again, that's a foundation for that ethical commitment to brotherhood that Dr. King thought was the answer to the question of how to solve for the issue of inequality, all right? So the point in all of these stories, the story about Brian and Montgomery, Lonnie working for so long, Joan working in the medical school, it's a story of courage. Mm -hmm. And in his description of his principle of nonviolence, Dr. King said of himself, you know, there came a day when I realized as the philosopher of nonviolence, I couldn't keep a gun. <laughs> I had to give up my gun. He kept a gun at home for safety's sake. It's like I had to give up my gun. So at that moment, I faced death. And I had to overcome my fear of death and confront everything with a dangerous unselfishness. Yeah. Dangerous unselfishness is another definition of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Dangerous unselfishness. And that's just another word for courage. So even in our small work, we can build a life of commitment. And here at Featherbedded Harvard, we, of all places, here is the place we should all be building a life a committed life, a life of ethical commitment, enjoying our privileges, which we're happy to enjoy, only because it's not enough when they are privileges restricted in this way. Because we're going to use these privileges to transform the structures that are generating them. So I want to close with Dr. King's words, how else could one possibly conclude a conference on his legacy. 
So the final few paragraphs of the drum major instinct. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life mm -hmm. behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, we heard today about the part of King that is about his theology, and it's got to be in there to know who he was. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right side or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your best side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth mm -hmm. and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very powerful. <laughs> that was great. That was great. All right, we're going to um, open it up for questions. Um, we've got four mics, two on this floor and two on that floor. Uh, while people are gathering themselves um, as moderator, I'll extend a privilege to really say, let's give Professor Allen another <laughs> round of applause. You. Um, you know, I think that was a powerful distillation of why King matters in our own time. And I was listening to um, Professor Trisha Rose earlier, and she was talking about how she's usually a pessimist, but she's, she's more optimistic. And I, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic, even while I'm very, very aware of the depth of the problems and the breadth of the problems we face. But when I hear um, Danielle's talk about a committed life, I think that we've been seeing so many different groups, and especially young people, um, who, are, who are dynamically engaged in that committed life. And for, for earlier generations, especially baby boomers, there's, that ti there's times there's a dissonance. There's at times a cultural and cognitive and generational dissonance where there's not an appreciation by either generations of each other, right? So, um, and Professor West was talking about this earlier today in terms of spirituality. And when I listen to somebody like Kendrick Lamar, and I'm 45, I do still listen and hear echoes of Mahalia Jackson and that, that black church tradition. I think that there are young people who are millennials who are spiritually nourished, whose music is spiritually and morally edifying and is in that Kingian tradition. When, when Danielle talks about a committed life, I think about the, the marchers for justice that just, that just marched 800 youth marches against gun violence all across the United States. I think about Black Lives Matter. I think about immigration rights and, and, and the dreamers, right? I think about Me Too. I think about all these different movements for social and political justice that are following in that tradition, even as we face these, these different uh, economic and racial and gender um, and, and sexual orientation uh, struggles uh, in our own time. So this is a time, I think, to be optimistic. I think the committed life that King talked about was this notion that we could all be great because we could all be of service, but he, he, he was indefatigable in keeping up a faith that things would get better. And this wasn't an unearned faith. It, this wasn't just a belief in things not seen because he saw things change and transform in his own lifetime, although he always argued that it wasn't enough. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. And again, I'm, I'm actually optimistic, even with the New York Times data that we've seen, even with all these negative social economic indicators, I'm optimistic because so many n millions of young people are joining this fight. They're joining this struggle um, for, for radical democracy, and they're realizing that citizenship means more than just the vote. 
Can you please tell us your name, please? Yeah, um, my name is Jackson Grigsby, and I'm a sophomore at the college. I wanted to thank you for your remarks today, Professor Allen. Um, I was just going to ask that you spoke about um, public perception and education in the South, and the fact that um, I, I think that it's uh, two thirds of white Southerners still believe that um, s slavery was not the cause of s the Civil War. Um, I was just wondering how do we educate and how do we um, kind of make our country be believe that we are that we are the same, that we are equal, that um, that um, black individuals do not deserve to be incarcerated, that we are equal, and how do we change this public perception that says that blacks are inferior still, still this kind of enlightenment and um, belief that we're uh, inferior that pervades uh, society today? How do we educate? So, you know, King has, I think, two straightforward answers for you. I mean, his first, um, when he, when he's describing the campaign of nonviolence and the campaign of protest action and so forth, he says the very first purpose of this work is to educate. And he's educating in how the work is being carried out, but he's also educating in terms of the claims he's putting on the table, the demands he's putting on the table. So in the first instance, I mean, I think I would second Professor Joseph and say a, there, a lot of the activist work that's underway is educating America in this fashion. But King also understood the power of the arts. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you, it's those moments when you feel incredibly jealous when he says like, Jimmy Baldwin. I'm like, oh man, like I wanna say Jimmy Baldwin. <laughs> right, so he's, you know, he's somebody he knew, he said, you know, Jimmy Baldwin did so much to transform the understanding of white America. So art is really powerful. Ava DuVernay is incredibly yeah. powerful. Mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander's book and so forth. This, is, this material is as important as the hard work in protesting, as the hard work in policy. We've got to keep all three of those things going. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. And that being said, I should plug some Harvard uh, professor's books right here. Tommy Shelby and Brandon Terry have an extraordinary That's anthology true. on Martin Luther King Jr.'s thought. Um, that just came out, The Political Philosophy and Political Thought of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Cornell West has the Radical King anthology, which is brilliant. Um, and Brandon has the Boston Review um, special issue on Martin Luther King Jr. T today. So these are all things people should be reading. Can you tell us your here, name, please? Here. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elam Avakami. I am a, a MD student at the Harvard Medical School and an MPP student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Mm. Um, brilliant, brother. I love yeah. it. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, feeling optimistic uh, in this present moment, and um, one of the things that, that uh, keeps me from feeling as optimistic as I would like to is my perception that in a lot of spaces where uh, real change needs to happen, like the Kennedy School, for example, um, the idea of change is a fashionable one, um, but the actual hard work that needs to be done for change to be precipitated uh, is a place that people are and institutions are still reluctant to go, and um, I'm wondering, like for instance, we're at, we at, we're at the you know the commemoration of Dr. King's death. We have some of the giants of you know African American scholarship here. Uh, this is a great forum event, um, but yet and still, when Monday comes, uh, we are still struggling to recruit African American professors to make the problem of the color line a central problem in the Kennedy School curriculum even though it is one of the defining public policy problems of American history. Um, and so, but yet yeah, this is a place where like, we will have this form of event and everyone will smile and they'll take great pictures and we'll go home. So, mm -hmm. so I'm struggling, uh, I'm wondering if you can give me some insights on um, how realistic you feel uh, the, the likelihood of real changes given how hard it is to get the people who need to give some things up and sacrifice some things and move some things uh, how hard it is to get them to do that. Long conversation. Yeah. So we should talk also more in depth afterwards, but let me just say, first of all, I think I was thinking about this question of uh, nonviolence and Dr. King's work outside of the halls of power versus the same kind of principles of courage and dangerous unselfishness inside the halls of power and how do you transfer the one from the other and one of the incredible powers of what he did was about solidarity, right? 
groups of people working together. And that's the first and most important thing. But sometimes there isn't somebody else, it's just you. Okay, then extra level of courage. But if there's a couple other people, first of all, just put yourselves together and make a commitment to yourself. Think you gotta do the strategizing for yourself, but this week, here's the thing that we're gonna put on the table. Here's the conversation we're gonna have with the dean. Here's the conversation we're gonna have with the dean of admissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then check in with each other, you know, and you just gotta keep pushing it. And that's what sort of Joan was saying to me. You know, she's like, you know, Danielle, you've just gotta, you know, I hear you, you're frustrated, uh, it's hard work, but A, you know, you gotta anticipate the objections and you've gotta vocalize the objections for them before they can even get there and already be ahead of that mm -hmm. objection. And B, the other thing you've gotta do is gotta be very concrete about the specific thing that you think will make the next difference that matters. And you gotta get ahead of those objections, stay concrete, and just keep pushing with people. Hey, thank you all for a wonderful day. Um, my question is in regards to um, politics and voting. Uh, so whenever we think of King, I think the most prominent things that I think of that come to mind are the Voting and Civil Rights Acts and the role that he played in getting those passed at the federal level. Yet, whenever I really, really think about it, I think that Selma and Montgomery at those local levels played uh, perhaps the greatest role in getting those two pieces of legislation passed. Um, so whenever we talk about voting, specifically in the contemporary era, I think that uh, the, the dialogue is greatly overburdened with the idea of the federal uh, executive, especially with the 4-5 administration in there. So um, my question is, um, what do you see the role of local politics, specifically non-executive local politics, like your boards of education and your zoning boards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that I see playing such a huge role in a lot of the racial disparities that we see in the United States of America, but yet never get any attention. For example, uh, I come from a city of 120,000 people in which the mayor was elected with 6,700 votes. So I see um, in the future there being a, 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 a local, a, a ripe local poli political landscape that we're able to make changes in. Yeah. So what do you see as a, uh, the focus in the future of what of city are you from? Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, nice. um, yeah. yeah. What? 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 How do we look at local politics as a means of changing national politics uh, into the future? I think you answered the question. <laughs> you asked and answered the question, right? There's a huge amount of power going unused at the local level. Professor Scotchpole was talking about this earlier today. No question about it. Building organizing power at the local level is fundamental, especially if you're thinking about something like criminal justice which is where the bulk of the infrastructure is, which is that, you know, it's the design of the Constitution that criminal justice would be at the state level. And so it's a, it's a real mismatch of attention to target that issue at federal policy. But you have to actually, you have to do that state level work in order to open up economic possibilities actually, and in fact to have an impact on some of the economic policy because of the way in which at the state level criminal justice stuff is connected to issues of health. And the issue of healthcare is really deeply connected to our bigger kind of economic policy. So the hard thing about our system is you gotta work at the state level in order to affect the macro questions. But I'm gonna just throw out one other slightly wacky idea for everybody just to play with, because it's just sort of, it's my current idea toy. Uh, so jury duty. We have jury duty. We pay people to serve on juries. Nobody complains, nobody wants to serve really, but we don't complain about the institution of jury duty for which we pay people. You see where this is going? Voter duty, for which you pay people. If you wanna get your basic minimum income in there, our political institutions, the economist Herbert Simon has made the argument that the wealth that capitalists in this country acquire um, when you compare it to the kind of levels of wealth, average wealth income in a place like India, the discrepancy can be accounted for in part by the strength and caliber and stability and actually conservatism of our political institutions, right? So our political institutions are a co-owned asset. That's an argument I've actually made already prior to this particular thought. They're a co-owned asset that are generating our wealth. Well, maybe we should pay ourselves for maintaining those institutions with a voter duty and a payment for voting. I don't know. 
Can you tell us your name, please? Hello. Oh, whatever. H- Hello. Hi My there. name is, is Kamal Ali. Okay. Good to see you. And good to see you. Thank you. I am a sophomore at the Extension School uh, from Baltimore. Great. And I got to run to play some basketball, but I have a quick question. <laughs> I love I, your, I love your dis- honesty, brother. I've, 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 never, been, I've never been dissed quite like that before. Yeah. I love yeah. your honesty, brother. Exactly. That's <laughs> no, good. That's what, that's the basketball. That's good. That's fair. That's all right. Yeah, I got to run too. I got to go play. Oh, we'll, play, we'll play together. We'll play together. <laughs> My question is, um, of course, there's a lot of discrimination, not only in America, but throughout the world. Yeah. How do you see not just African Americans getting together, but people of all ethnicities, color, races, socioeconomic statuses coming together to make the world a better place? Thank you for that question. And I didn't... Simple. Po- Nothing, right? Good question. <laughs> but it, it's, e- it's easy. These questions are easy in the abstract form. The hard part is in the reality. Absolutely. That's the trouble. Like, you know, whatever. We have these great traditions of political philosophy that have answered these questions. And again, like, abstractly, it's not hard. The hard part is turning it into real human institutions and practices. But just to kind of... To let me go to the concept again for a minute. So I, it's partly what I was trying to get at in the beginning of my remarks. This notion actually that a part of achieving the ethic of brotherhood, the egalitarian institutions domestically and internationally, is about reinventing how people wield power. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, abstractly, that's very easy to say. It trips off the tongue. In concrete terms, that's very hard to do because, um, I mean, it means all kinds of things. It means different approaches to decision-making at all levels of an organization. You know, Harvard is an incredibly hierarchical place. This is something that we're all talking about right now. And a very, like, critical, like, little teeny level, students don't serve a role on very many committees. Their voices don't enter into the decision-making processes. Well, you know, uh, Harvard that was more flexible, was more egalitarian, would find ways of bringing student voices into more channels of decision making. So, like that's a teeny concrete example and that doesn't speak to the issue of how you bring in everybody but the point is that if you could actually reinvent how power is wielded and people have it's just it's just democratic theory basically but apply it throughout organizations and institutions that should be good for everybody just as Dr. Joseph says like the ideas may come from the pursuit of black equality in the first place mm-hmm. the idea that as I would not be a slave so I would not be a master. But if you could really build a world in which nobody you know, had the opportunity to use the stuff of power to be a master, that would be good for everybody, right? And so that's how you begin to bring in and turn the story that was about one freedom struggle into a story that is about justice for all. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, right here and then, can you tell us your name please? Hi, um, my name is Nadine Corey. I'm a sophomore here at the college. Thank Welcome. you so much for your remarks today. Um, I the first I, I really like this idea of brotherhood that you um, bring up, and I just had kind of one slash two questions about um, kind of implementing it and how you see it kind of working. I think of the United States as a place that's obviously very diverse, and I feel like the idea of brotherhood kind of Im- implies that you're kind of growing up with someone that you understand this person on a fundamental level or understand kind of each other, and I feel like in places that are not necessarily very diverse racially or socioeconomically, um, and you grow up with maybe the same demographic of people, I wonder kind of how you think you can kind of start to foster that either from a young age or have people kind of acquire this kind of common sense of kind of ethical brotherhood. Additionally, kind of piggybacking off of the question that was asked two people ago, do you see this um, as national change affecting, like a national mechanism affecting local change or more local politics affecting the social level on a national scale? Like, do you see it starting from the bottom up or the top to the bottom, like top going down to the bottom? Really important questions, thank you. So, um, let's take the first one. I think that there are, where'd you go? Oh, there you go, okay, you sat down. I'm like, whoa, that was a disappearing lady. All right, it's okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, yes, uh, there's a great book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort, which mm-hmm. reviews the way in which the country has become 
socioeconomically and ideologically um, segregated in addition to ongoing racial segregation. The racial segregation story is a bit complicated. There are sort of parts of the story that look like improvements and parts of the story that don't. But at any rate, so we do have a, a problem in terms of the basic fabric um, of how we are distributed through space. I, there are ways you can think about responding to that. So for example, I'm very interested in a national service idea that would mix people up. Though I should say I'm interested in that not only because of the mixing it would achieve, but also as a way of thinking about the militarism question that Professor Terry raised earlier, which we really do not pay enough attention to, mm -hmm. but the military in this country has been fundamentally transformed since the end of the draft. Yeah. There is no more democratic accountability for the American military. Let me repeat that. There is no democratic accountability attached to the American military. Congress has the responsibility of appropriating funds every two years for the standing army, constitutional requirement, right? That's technically a check, but that's, it gets slipped into the budget, which means Congress never has to debate the fact that we've been at war since 2001 continuously. The budgets support incredible technology investments. The footprint of American engagement gets smaller and smaller right, because we, can, we do it all with weapons, we don't do it with people. You know, we, we're, we're at war out there, and none of us mm -hmm. think about that, all right? And when the Constitution was designed, I know I've gotten way away from your question, but <laughs> when the Constitution was designed, the, I mean, you know, A, Madison predicted, there will not be standing armies, all right? So that's a prediction that's been wrong about how the country unfolded, but as they thought about the design, they specifically designed in checks that were supposed to maintain democratic accountability over the military. So when I say that we have a problem of lack of democratic accountability, I'm offering you the argument <coughs> of a constitutional conservative, okay? It's not even a radical argument. It's just an 18th century Republican argument, all right? So we should really like sit up and wake up. So national service addresses both the geographical issue and the militarism issue. But on the second question, state versus federal, both of the things you said are relevant. I mean, the machinery of American democracy involves policy experimentation at the state level and huge systemic effects achieved that way with interactions with the federal level. So you have to think about the interactions between them and both parts simultaneously. The question of where one invests one's personal time and effort depends on the question of what your deepest commitments are because you have to be in the place where you feel most passionately connected to your work, because that is the only thing that will sustain you yeah. in doing the hard work yeah. of a committed life. Oh, right there. And then. Hi, my name is Jose Martinez. I'm a freshman here at the college. Hi, Jose. Hi, I'm from the city of brotherly love, uh, and I have a question here. Uh, so in what I think is the greatest work of art in human history, King's letter from Birmingham jail, he speaks on the idea of the white moderate, whites who are more committed to, in King's words, order than justice. And at this point in time, blacks were divided into groups, again in King's words, forced into complacency or to advocating violence. Now that things have slightly improved, I have seen in my own communities and others the formation of a new group, one created by the force of moderation, the black moderate, those who are satisfied with where they are and see no need to go further. King, in my opinion, would understand us for not being where we should be, but he would never forgive us for becoming satisfied at a, part, at a point so far from the glorious land he envisioned. Would you say this is an accurate characterization? Is it a problem? If so, how do we st stop it? How do we motivate those satisfied to keep fighting? Thank you for that. That was beautifully formulated. Um, so yes, I think you've got it right. And I think by asking the questions that you've just asked, that you're putting the energy into our communal space to build the motivation to move forward. So keep talking the way you just talk to all of us. And I think that's part of the answer. Oh, that's great. That's nice and short. We, let's get as many <laughs> as possible in the last five minutes. Can you tell us your name, please? Short all question. Right, hi, thank you. My name is Guy. I am a genocide survivor from Darfur, but currently a student at uh, Harvard University. Um, transiting to law school. Uh, my concern is if you uh, see how the American Constitution is written, like 
on the how the amendments were made. Um, it was long time ago, but all these amendments were never changed or were never amended to have uh, an idea that would include uh, or provide accessibility to everyone uh, as a citizen. Um, how do you see it's possible that we would eventually be able to live uh, the society or the community that we are all dreaming to, to live in? Um, just looking at the uh, US Congress, I, I don't see it really resemble what America is. And also using uh, Wall Street and all these really uh, higher uh, institution, how is that possible to really change these concrete uh, uh, institutions? So there are two institutional reforms that I'm interested in on that front. One is uh, what lots of people call mandatory voting, but which I just called voter duty, <laughs> right? Except for most people don't attach pay to it, so I guess that does make it a little nicer than the way I was just formulating it. Mandatory voting I think is worth thinking about, actually. Um, because it's actually a way of addressing the problem of money in politics. Because once you know, or what, actually, you're supposed to, well, I've been told that technically you're not supposed to say mandatory voting, you're supposed to say mandatory attendance at the polls. Because actually there's no requirement actually to vote if you don't want to, obviously, when you step into the polls. But what that does is um, mean that candidates have to campaign towards the swing voters rather than um, using money to turn out their voters and to suppress the turnout of the other side. Right? So currently, campaign finance is directed towards turnout. Turn out yours, suppress the others. That disappears if you've, or maybe disappears is too strong. Professor Scotchville will probably correct me. Um, if you um, have mandatory voting, and then the efforts of campaigning can get focused more on the persuadable middle voters. Another reform that I think would change um, how Congress functions that I would like to see more discussion of is a combination of multi-member congressional districts and ranked choice voting, um, which would mean that in any given congressional district, you would have you know, pluralistic representation as a form of proportional representation, and you would, in, in many circumstances, find yourself with um, you know, a, 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 a representative from each party, say Democratic and Republican, representing the same constituency, and they would therefore need to think about their work as representatives somewhat differently than they currently do. So anyway, those are two uh, reforms that I hope you'll all go talk to your friends about. <laughs> all right, uh, time-wise, this is gonna be the, the last question here. Uh, well, first off, thank you, Professor Allen. Um, thank you, Doctor. Uh, my question is, well, I'll get to my question, but uh, Martin Luther King was known for a lot of things, um, and one of them was the Poor People's Campaign, which, in my opinion, isn't known as much as some of his other ideas and his other concepts. Um, and, and speaking in modern terms, uh, Senator Sanders, I think, epitomizes that, that poor people's campaign. Um, however, in my high school, whenever I'd, in, whenever I'd debate uh, that and I'd bring up Senator Sanders, it always seemed very um, divisive. And I think that speaks to how, div how divisive our, our culture is in the US on a whole, not just at my high school. Um, but people would be quick to, to label that as, as, as communist or socialist and taking people's rights. Um, but how do, my question is, how do you relay the moral imperativeness um, and the necessity for a poor people's campaign um, in, in today's world? Oh, okay, thanks. So and, and what's the, 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 most, the best way of, of achieving that end? And, and similar to Dean's question, is it a top-down thing or, or bottom-up? Anything that's going to last is bottom up, but you know, bottom up's got to be aimed at what's happening at the top. So in that regard, they never come apart from each other, I would say. But I think um, you know, people often um, lift up the example of marriage equality as a case in which there was a just stunning change in public opinion over a very short span of time. Let's say you know, over a period of just a couple of decades. The country went from being very negative um, on issues of gay rights and certainly gay marriage, as then formulated, to being quite open to marriage equality. And I think that is an important case because it, it's sort of proof of concept that you shouldn't take for granted what the kind of thing is that people mostly say today. It could be different in 20 years. So then the question is how to make it different. 
And again, that case is just a beautiful kind of case study for really intentional thought about changing the frames people are using for thinking about an issue, changing the narrative. I think there's a lot of work, good work that's underway um, that's trying to do that with living wage concept. Um, it's hard uh, work, and I think the biggest challenge is like sort of failure of coordination across different interest efforts. To, so to some extent, um, some of the narrative work would get more powerful if there were more alliance formations across different kinds of what look like separate interests at the moment. Mm. Or 1720, when it was even more absurd. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, you know, we, we all try to make our contributions to our community. Right. But, you know, integrating the faculty and faculty are, are success. Um, getting more black students in the game. Mm -hmm. Whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you piece together a larger vision for moving toward that goal which became, I don't know, when you want, the civil passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, whatever it is right. in 1920, you see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's true that we are, we are failing to coordinate around a single goal. And that, I mean, I, you think we probably all have this experience. Any, whatever conversation you have about racial justice, racial equality, you know, there's a bunch of people over here pursuing prison abolition, there's a bunch of people over here pursuing basic, uh, m you know, basic guaranteed income or whatever, um, you know, sort of a group of people over here who are thinking about voting rights, redistricting, campaign finance. And we're trying to recruit more black people to Harvard. But it's <laughs> still part of the vision. It is. I don't think I have an answer to your question. I'm sorry, Skip. I mean, what, what could the answer be? I think, you know, I don't think the answer is, you know, who's the single person who's going to generate that coordination? I think it's instead, you know, I'm sort of, at the moment I'm inspired by, we had this lecture in the Safra Center last night um, by a philosopher named Philippe von Paris, who, um, you know, took, you know, King's concept from, from the 60s and then kind of worked through other people. Anyway, in the 80s, he um, picked it up, but he built a kind of network of folks in Europe who are all interested in this idea. The network just kind of kept, kept growing bigger and bigger. And to some extent, I think like, that's kind of like what we're missing somehow, and I don't know exactly how to go about building it, but you know, networks or even just like an, literally an annual conference of some sort that brings together in a kind of cross-sectoral, cross-interest way a lot of different constituencies and supports the emergence of a shared paradigm. So not expecting a single person to generate the shared paradigm, but building a context where you have a kind of network of people who are working together to kind of harvest an emergent shared paradigm out of that conversation. And I do think that's a place where millennial forms of organization and activism um, have power in them and lessons that are unfamiliar and slightly nervous making to older generations. Uh, yes. um, <laughs> but I think it's real. I think there's real stuff there and um, at any rate, I think maybe I'll leave it there. So maybe the thing is, actually I do say this to my students a lot, um, you know, because, okay, I am a constitutional conservative in a lot of ways, right? Like I love the Declaration of Independence, blah, blah, blah. I like to think about the Constitution. So, but it matters that like, you know, Jefferson, Madison, these people, they were in their 30s. So it's like, so I'm always saying to my students, I'm just like, hey, people, it's, it's, it's you guys. It's like, I mean, it, it really is about a novel imagination and seeing possibilities that those who have been habituated in another set of institutional structures are gonna have a hard time seeing. But it's like really, you think about it, like that revolutionary architecture was done by 30 year olds. We forget that because the paintings always have like white wigs. <laughs> but like, you know, basically they were the millennials, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> all right. All right, we're, gu we're good, yeah. All right. Thank you, this was great.